Some 19 seasons before the University of Central Florida had its self-proclaimed national championship season, the program found itself well and truly screwed out of a bowl game. Despite holding a provisional invitation from the Oahu Bowl and seemingly being a shoe in for the Micron PC Bowl set to be played in Miami, the team ended up sitting at home once college football's postseason kicked off. That was in spite of the fact that the Knights had a 9-2 record and one of the nation's more exciting offenses led by Heisman Trophy candidate Dante Culpepper. I'm Cheyenne Hollis. This is the touchback, and today we are retelling the tale of how a hurricane and the Miami Hurricanes would cost UCF its first ever bowl game appearance. First, a disclaimer. I thoroughly enjoy the fact that the University of Central Florida claims to have won the national championship in 2017. This is just one of those stories, one of those things that makes college football such a great sport. That being said, I don't necessarily know if the Knights have a great claim to being the actual national championships in that season. What I will say though is this, those Knights fans, well they have a reason, a very good reason to be ticked off about not going bowling in 1998. It would have been well deserved for a program that had been in existence for less than 20 years and had only moved up to Division 1 in 1996. Let's start there. The Golden Knights as they were known as then, or just the Knights as we call them today, had a perfectly reasonable first two seasons in college football's top flight, finishing 5-6 and six on both occasions. As a program trying to find itself as a Division I independent, this was certainly not the worst start in the world. However, there were reasons to believe the team would be better in 1998, chief among them, junior quarterback Dante Culpepper. 1998 did not get off to the best of starts for UCF though. Their head coach Gene McDowell would actually resign in January of that year after he pled guilty to lying to federal agents and lying to a grand jury. That all stemmed from secret service agents raiding the Knights locker room in 97 as part of a federal cell phone fraud investigation. Without getting too lost in the weeds, here is an abbreviated version of what happened. A former Knights player who had at one time also worked at AT&T hooked a bunch of the team up with free phone numbers with no building, that of course being a crime. McDowell, it turns out, was informed of the raid before it actually happened, told all of the players what to look out for, also told them to lie about what they knew, what they had, all of that stuff. It was a classic cover-up. The feds being the feds eventually found out what McDowell did anyway and then of course popped him on those lying charges. With McDowell resigning, the school would turn to offensive coordinator Mike Kuzchek to lead things on an interim basis for 1998. By the time spring ball began, things were pretty much business as usual for UCF. While Dante Culpepper had brought some attention on the UCF program the year before, there still wasn't a whole lot known or expected from the team heading into 1998. Their season opener would come against fellow independent Louisiana Tech, a school, by the way, who themselves had been screwed out of a bowl bid in 1997. This road showdown was the season opener for UCF, but not Louisiana Tech, who had played a week zero contest against Nebraska one week prior. That game was wild because Louisiana Tech wide receiver Troy Edwards posted 405 receiving yards in a losing effort. Allow me to state this again, 405 receiving yards in a single game. Absolute scenes, man. On this day though, Louisiana Tech was no match for the Knights who raced out to a 27-10 lead at halftime. This would be a statement game of sorts for Culpepper, who finished the day with five touchdowns total and threw for 370 yards. The following week, Central Florida would easily dispatch 1AA Eastern Illinois with Culpepper again putting up impressive numbers. Of course, there's only so much you can glean from a body bag game like this. That is why all of the attention, all of the eyes of the nation would turn towards Central Florida's Week 3 showdown against a Drew Brees-led Purdue team. This was UCF's first ever game on national television with ESPN broadcasting the game to the entire country, a milestone for UCF no doubt. Unfortunately, what people saw was not exactly the best version of the Knights. The final scoreline certainly flatters Purdue, it was 35-7, however it was really a game of a lot of what-ifs if you were a UCF fan. 
With Purdue leading 7-0 early on, the Knights drove all the way down the field, got inside the five-yard line before Dante Culpepper would throw an interception that was returned to the house despite a sort of forward-looking lateral. Later on in the first half, UFC recorded a turnover on downs on Purdue's one-yard line. Despite the lopsided scoreline, this was a far more even game than that would indicate. In fact, it could be argued Central Florida simply shot themselves in the foot with costly turnovers and a number of mistakes that would have otherwise seen a competitive matchup. There was no time to stew on what could have been for UCF in Week 3, though. Week 4 would actually end up being a pivotal moment for the team's season, even if they didn't necessarily know it at the time. On the field, they headed to Bowling Green, where they found themselves in a back-and-forth tussle with the Falcons. UCF trailed for large portions of this game, but eventually kicked in the gear during the second half and would prevail 38-31. Culpepper again having a monster game, five more touchdowns, and really just impressing anyone who saw him. What was happening off the field back in Florida, though, would end up having far more reaching repercussions than the Knights could have ever imagined at the time. A showdown between third-ranked UCLA and Miami was canceled on the Thursday before that weekend due to Hurricane Georgs. No makeup date was announced at first and everyone just sort of went along on their way. More on this though in a bit. UCF would turn its attention to more MAC opposition with games at Toledo and at home versus Northern Illinois up next. Culpepper led the team to two more victories, pushing their record to 5-1 on the season and really establishing the quarterback as a legitimate Heisman contender. After a bye week, UCF would head down to face southwestern Louisiana, which would eventually be known as Louisiana Lafayette, and then eventually known as Louisiana. The Raging Cajuns were not particularly good in 1998, and UCF dominated on this day, winning 42-10. Next up for the Knights was Youngstown State, a Division I AA opponent, but not necessarily your run-of-the-mill 1AA opponent. They had won the national championship in 1997 and had already beaten Kent State during 98. Now, it should be noted, Kent State, not good at all. They would go 0-11 this year, but hey, a D1 AA team beating a D1 team is still a feat no matter how bad that D1 team is. Central Florida had no issues with their lower level opposition early on, running out to a 25-point lead. Things, though, would eventually change with the Penguins making a comeback and actually closing the gap to a single score. That would be as close as Youngstown State got on this day. The Knights would pull away and get the victory. One potential reason for the disjointed performance from the Knights on that day was because the next week they had a huge showdown against Auburn at Jordan-Hare Stadium. Let's just be honest here. This is one of the worst Auburn teams in possibly their history. Terry Bowden was fired after the first six games. They would end up 3-8 and eight overall. This was not a intimidating Auburn side. This was not a SEC powerhouse. They were just flat out bad. That aside, this matchup was extremely important for UCF, who was still looking for their first victory over what would have been a major conference team. That is what makes this result so disheartening. This was a game the Knights just flat out lost. They should have won this game. They could have won it going away, but instead, again, just mistakes cost them what should have been a victory. Despite the turnovers and despite all of the red zone trips without points, things were still looking good for the Knights with two minutes left in the fourth quarter. And then... With time winding down, an absolutely shocking touchdown pass from Auburn allowed the Tigers to take their first lead 10-6. Central Florida did get the ball back, but they couldn't really do anything with it, and they would lose the game by that score of 10-6. You know, going back and watching this game, I still don't understand how the Knights lost. They were the better team, they should have won, and they just choked it away. Now, it could be argued the team, the program, it had never been in that situation before. While they had played a close game against Old Miss a season prior, they had never had the lead late in a game against a big name powerhouse school, even if that powerhouse was not particularly powerful in 98. 
even knowing that they hadn't had an experience like that closing out an upset, you still watch the game back and you're just like, how did you lose it? You just, it was, even as a neutral, it was kind of frustrating to go back and just see UCF just botch what should have been a landmark win for the program. That aside, the Knights still closed out their season in style with a pair of victories over Ball State in New Mexico. During those contests, scouts from several bowl games were in attendance to see what UCF had to offer. With a 9-2 record, a good story, and a quarterback who made the team must watch television, it seemed like the case was going to be where and not if UCF would be playing come bowl time. Even as an independent with no bowl tie-ins, the situation still seemed extremely favorable for them. The answer to the question of where Central Florida would be playing hinged on the result of that Miami and UCLA game, which in fact had not been canceled. UCLA desperately needed this game. They needed to win this game in order to keep their hopes of reaching the inaugural BCS championship game alive. UCLA football and national championship, those are two things not heard in the same sentence for what seems like maybe decades now. Anyway, the rescheduled contest would be moved to conference championship game weekend. It also had a huge bearing on the Knights' postseason plans. The Oahu Bowl had already told the Knights they were in. The invitation was in the mail should the Bruins beat the Hurricanes. Elsewhere, the Micron PC Bowl, a Miami Bowl game that was originally known as the Blockbuster Bowl, would eventually move to Orlando and is now, today, the Pop-Tarts Bowl, was also strongly considering UCF, but really wanted to get a sense of how everything would play out during conference championship game weekend before finalizing their decision. Fair enough, by the way. What did happen was extremely unfortunate news for night fans. UCLA coughed up. A chance to play in the national championship game, losing to a seemingly and suddenly resurgent Miami Hurricanes team that in the previous game had been absolutely throttled by an 8-3 Syracuse side. The result meant UCLA would play in the Rose Bowl, which would knock all of the Pac-12 schools down a slot. The Oahu Bowl, who had extended UCF the provisional, Bowl invitation had to rescind that because they were now obligated to take Washington due to bowl tie-ins. The Micron PC Bowl lost interest in UCF since they had a buzzworthy and headline generating Miami program in their own backyard they could take. That brings us to the 1998 Sun Bowl who could take any bowl eligible team they wished as the Big Ten could not fulfill its commitments to the game. Did they take the 9-2 and two Knights looking for their first ever bowl bid and with one of the nation's top players? Nope. What about the 10-1 Miami of Ohio Redhawks who upset number 12 North Carolina? Get real. The Sun Bowl opted for a 7-5 TCU team. So what were the Horned Frogs credentials in 1998? Well, they were the 5th best team. Sorry, they were the 5th best team in the WAC. Correction, they were the fifth best team in the WAC Mountain Division. But before you let that sink in, hear this. In the WAC Mountain Division, Wyoming finished 8-3, beat TCU, didn't get a bowl invite. Colorado State finished 8-4, beat TCU, didn't get a bowl invite. Look, you could make a case against giving UCF, who was 9-2 and an independent and beat a bunch of Mac schools a bowl bid. I would get that argument, but in no right mind was TCU worthy of any sort of bowl invite this year. Here's the deal. If Hurricane Georg didn't postpone the UCLA at Miami game that year, UCF is more than likely going bowling, regardless of who would have won. For starters, the Oahu Bowl invite is never tentatively extended to them. They don't get their hopes up there if UCLA would have lost that game. It would have been a path closed to Central Florida, but at the same time, they would have known the score. And even if Miami were to have won that game, well, the Micron PC Bowl wouldn't have taken the Hurricanes that year anyway, assuming they had gotten crushed by Syracuse like they did at the last game of their Big East slate. So the reason why the Micron PC Bowl was considering UCF over Miami was because of the fact no one in Miami wanted to see a team in the postseason that just let Syracuse score 66 points against them. 
And if the game was just canceled outright, like let's say it's rescheduled, but UCLA and Miami decide they don't need to play it anyway, UCF also gets a bowl bid in this scenario. Not only did the Knights spend 1998 with their Heisman candidate quarterback at home during the college football postseason, well, things were just going to slowly go downhill from this point. Dante Culpepper, of course, would leave school after a junior and get drafted with the 11th overall pick by the Minnesota Vikings. Mike Khrushchev did okay for the next few years, finishing with a winning record in four of his six seasons. However, expectations for the program began to rise after they moved to the MAC in 2002. Let's not forget, that was a thing. Uh, anyway, Khrushchev would be let go after a 3-7 and seven start in the 2003 season. George O'Leary, presumably with an updated resume, was hired as the Knights' next coach ahead of 2004, with the team again preparing to change conferences, this time heading to Conference USA. In 2005, O'Leary would guide Central Florida to its first ever bowl game, as this time there was nothing tentative about their invitation to the Hawaii Bowl. The Knights would lose in a heartbreaking fashion to Nevada, falling due to a missed extra point in overtime in what happens to be one of college football's craziest bowl games and one that probably isn't remembered enough. UCF fans will always feel hard done by what happened to their team in 2017. Fair play to them. If they want to have that argument, go wild with it. But I think the 1998 UCF team is the one that really got the short end of the stick here. A hurricane and the Miami Hurricanes prevented those Knights from making their first ever appearance in a college football bowl game. Thank you for watching this video. If you'd like to know more about, say, why promotion and relegation doesn't work in college football, well, you can check out the video right there. Until next time, I'm Shane Hollis. This is the Touchback. Hashtag take it out to the 25.